Okay. <laughs> Happy Mother's Day. Mm-hmm. Let's start with any good news we have today. Does anyone have any good news? Yes. Yes. Joanne. Y'all went to Alabama's graduation. You had two grandsons graduate. That's wonderful. (laughs) And we don't need any of that nonsense. (laughs) Okay, what about any um, changes to the prayer list or any updates? Does anyone have anything? Yes, Kevin. Steve Chantel. Okay. Yes. My daughter got on the night and said on the schedule for several weeks on the schedule and she said if she had a smart phone. So she summoned in and thanked her for all the Thank you, that's good news. Any other changes or updates to the prayer list? Uh Shannon. Just to bring you up to date on Gladys Williams. Uh, yes. she did go to the hospital yesterday, but I She did say she'd like to be remembered. Okay, Gladys Williams went to the hospital yesterday and would like to be remembered. And we can take Albert off. He's much better. That's awesome. Okay. Okay. Um, To go along with the good news... We're changing our family night this month from Wednesday to Thursday because it's going to be recognizing our graduates. We have three graduates. Um, Kaylee graduates Wednesday evening, so that's why we're changing it to Thursday. She will be attending Southeastern University of Missouri this fall with full tuition. You got a scholarship, Kaylee? Yes. That's awesome. (laughs) Fees and books and all paid scholarship. It looks like it says partial room and board. Yay, that's good. We're proud of you, Kaylee. Also, Ricky graduated from Graceland. Congratulations. (laughs) College of Arts and Sciences announced the graduation of Ricky Lynn Griffin, Jr. on Sunday, April 30th with a Bachelor of Science degree in biology. Congratulations. And I also have Kaylee's graduation announcement here from W.P. Davidson High School, class of 2017. It will be Wednesday, May 17th at three o'clock in the afternoon at the Mitchell Center. So family night will be Thursday night this week. Any birthdays that we need to recognize? Yes, Billy. Yours? Billy, when's your birthday? It was Thursday. Okay, happy birthday. Anyone else? Okay, let's sing to Billy. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Billy. Happy birthday to you. Does anyone have any other announcements that we need to cover? Thank you.
Good morning. Good morning. And I want to welcome you all here. In particular, I want to welcome the mothers, in which uh, I want to say Happy Mother's Day to you. Uh, I was thinking of all the people that have gone on this morning, and I can't name all of them because I probably missed somebody and I'm not, but they're in my memory as they were acting mothers to me in this congregation. And, that, and uh, they brought blessings to my ministry, to you, with uh, what they were doing. At this time, uh, Wayne and I are, are going to recognize the mothers that have gathered. All of us know that God is a God of love, and Jesus demonstrated that. And when I think of uh, mothers, I think of love. And uh, my mother, she called me many names, and uh, I started out as Jackie in life. And so if you call me Jackie, I know we're what part of my life you were in. And then I went from Jackie to Jack. When I got in high school, uh, my closest friends called me Johnny. And when I went in the military, I was called John. And that's what all of you know me by, John. Well, my mother called me all those names. Uh, she went with the flow, and she called me. But the last name she called me was Two. Because when I was talking to her on the phone just before she died, I said, I love you, Mom. And she said, I love you, too. And so I want to read from the 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians. Charity suffers long and is kind. Charity envies not. Charity vaults not itself, is not puffed up, does not behave itself unseemly, seeks not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil. Rejoice not in iniquity, but rejoice in the truth. Bear all things, believe all things, Hope for all things, endureth for all things. Let us worship that God of love.
Almighty God, our Father which art in heaven, it is with great expectancy that we come and gather as children of thine, as brothers and sisters, as family, to share in this worship service. And as we do, God, we humbly invite the presence and the power of thy Holy Spirit to be with us. We come here this day, Lord, not only to worship thee, but also to recognize and to honor those special women that have come into our lives as our mothers. We know, Father in heaven, that thy loving spirit has blessed these women and that has given them purpose in this life to raise us as their children, to watch over us, and to show us the closest thing that we might know as God's love. And so, Father in heaven, we pray that that loving spirit that each one of these ladies possess, that we might understand, comes through thee and through thy son, the Lord Jesus. They are special people, special servants, special disciples, special daughters of thine. We pray that as we worship here this day, that there will be a feeling of joy, a feeling of expectancy as we participate in this worship, and that we might recognize this day as a day thou hast given us to celebrate the gift of mothers into our lives. We thank you, Lord. We praise thy holy name. We ask these blessings now in the name of Jesus Christ, thy son. Amen. All of us would like to see peace in this world. I know that each of us desire peace in our lives. Most of us probably can remember when we received peace in our lives as children by our mothers. I guess you could say they were the first peacemakers. I know that my mother was because my mom lived for peace. She taught me the importance of peace and how I could create peace if I would only listen to my Heavenly Father and my earthly mother's teachings. Join me as I pray for peace. O oh Lord, sometimes our insides feel like a battle zone where missiles are falling too close to home. Other times we are caught in an endless storm with thoughts flying out of control. Confusion reigns, God, and defeat creeps in to steal our joy. We need your peace, the deep down in your heart kind that stays with us day and night. Calm our anxious spirit, Lord, and take away all the attacking if-onlys and what-ifs that fill us with needless worry. Whether in trivial or heavy matters, we know you will not only give us peace, Lord, you will be our peace. And when we draw close to you in prayer, in reading your mind and your word, 
in helping another and taking our minds off of ourselves, you will be there, up close and personal. We surrender and admit we can't control people, plans, or even our own circumstances. But we can yield those things to you and focus on your goodness. Thank you, God, today for every good gift you've given, every blessing you've sent, all the forgiveness we do not deserve, and for every trial you have allowed into our lives. You bring good out of every circumstance if we will only let go and believe in you. We know that when we pray and give thanks instead of worrying, you have promised that we can experience the kind of peace that passes all understanding. That's your kind of peace, Lord, and it's the kind of peace we all crave. God, I pray this in your Son's name, Jesus Christ, and I give you thanks. Amen. Good morning. We're at that part of the program that we call the Disciples' Generous Response. And I believe uh, more and more that generosity 
is a learned trait, not one that all of us are necessarily born with. And I think maybe one of the first person who teaches us that trait or that characteristic is our mothers. This past week I had the opportunity, uh, my niece and her husband and uh, their three-year-old was in town. Uh, they are being transferred back to Mobile and uh, so they were house hunting. But I had the opportunity to observe uh, my two grandnephews, their three-year-old Cameron and then my nephew's two-year-old Cannon and uh, observed their interaction. And um, now bear in mind that between the two of them, they probably have enough plastic to fill a small landfill because I'm talking about all the toys. But uh, at that age, they're very possessive, um, very jealous. Uh, it, they, one can have a handful of toys in front of them uh, if the other one takes one of those, it's like they have, uh, you know, just ended the world there. So um, what I observed was as the mothers very patiently and very uh, gently guided them, taught them, uh, inspired in them that sense of generosity that, that we all um, develop through age, or hopefully we develop through age. And so with that in mind, I, I came across this story. An old man was talking to his son, and he said there was a terrible fight going on within him. A fight between two wolves. On one side, one wolf was, and he described it, greedy, sorrowful, angry, arrogant, uh, feelings of inferiority, false pride, ego. And then on the other side was a wolf that was uh, the opposite of that. Good. His was joy, peace, love, hope, serenity, humility, kindness, benevolence, empathy, generosity, truth, compassion, and faith. And the son thought for a minute, and then he asked his father, he said, which one will win? And the father thought for a few minutes, and then his response was, the one you feed. May the ushers come forward. Let us pray. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we come before thee now at this time, and we take time to really take stock of all the many blessings that thou hast given to us, of all those things that we enjoy, all those things which we have, all those possessions that we have from you. And we pray, dear Father in heaven, that as we take inventory of all that thou hast given to us, may we also become even more and more aware of those that are less fortunate. For we know that in this world there is a great divide between those who have and those who have not. And we know that there are many who live in poverty. We know that there are many who have nothing of the possessions or materials of this world, many who are hungry. And so at this time, dear Father, we pray that thy might kindle within each of us and all of us that generosity of spirit, that those things which we have, that those things that we enjoy, that we are aware that they come from you, that they belong to you, and that it is our responsibility to share with those who are less fortunate. For these things we do pray in thy most holy name. Amen.
There are angels God puts on this earth who care for us and guide us. You can feel their love and gentleness as they walk through life beside us. They do great things for us every day. They whisper in our ears. They even hold us in their hearts when we are filled with all our fears. They are always there to give you a hug and try to make us smile. They treat us with respect and love. They treat us like their child. God bless them with an angel. I'm proud to call my own. She's been with me throughout my life, been with me as I've grown. She guided me the best she can. She taught me like no other. And I'm thankful. I'm the lucky one who gets to call her mother. A six-year-old boy became separated from his mother at Walmart. And um, he began to frantically yell, Martha, Martha, Martha because that was his mother's name. And she quickly became, she quickly ran to him and said, but honey, you shouldn't call me Martha. I'm mother to you. Yes, I know, he answered, but this story is full of mothers. <laughs> Our world is indeed full of mothers. And, but we only have one mother that's special. There is nothing else like our mothers and no one can take the place of our mother. Good morning and happy Mother's Day. Today we're here to worship our Lord and to honor our mothers. Not only are we commanded to honor our mothers, it's also one of the last things Christ did before he died on the cross when he commanded John to take care of his mother. Many of us here today, like me, wish we still had our mothers living so we could personally thank them, honor them, remember them, and love them. I found this list entitled, Things Our Mothers Taught Us. See if you can relate. I know Drew and I certainly can. My mother taught me to appreciate a job well done. If you're going to kill each other, do it outside. I just finished cleaning. <laughs> My mother taught me about religion. You better pray that comes out of the carpet. My mother taught me about time travel. If you don't straighten up, I'm going to knock you into the middle of next week. <laughs> My mother taught me about logic. She said, she said, because I say so, that's why. My mother taught me about behavior modification. Stop acting like your father. <laughs> My mother talked to me about ironing. Keep trying and I'll give you something to cry about. <laughs> My mother taught me about weather. This room of yours looks like a tornado went through it. My mother talked to me about the circle of life. I brought you into this world, I can take you out. <laughs> My mother talked to me about wisdom. When you get to be my age, you'll understand. And my mother talked to me about justice. One day, you'll have kids, and I hope they turn out just like you. <laughs> by, the time, by, the time, by the time the Lord made mothers, he was into his sixth day of working overtime. An angel said to him, Lord, you're sure spending a lot of time on this one. The Lord turned and said, have you read the specs on this model? She's supposed to be completely washable, but not plastic. Have 180 moving parts, all replaceable. Have a kiss that will heal everything from a broken leg to a broken heart. Have a lap that disappears when she stands up. 
be able to function on black coffee and leftovers and have six pairs of hands. Six pairs of hands, the angel said, that's impossible. It's not the pairs of hands that bothers me, said the Lord. It's those three pairs of eyes. She's supposed to have one pair that sees through closed doors so that whenever she says, what are you kids doing in there? She already knows what you're doing. She's to have a pair in the back of her head to see all the things she's not supposed to see but must see. And a pair in front of hers that can look at a child and just, that just goofed and communicate love and understanding without saying a word. That's too much, said the angel. You can't put that much into one model. Why don't you rest and resume creating tomorrow? No, I can't, said the Lord. I'm close to creating something very much like myself. I already came up with a model that can heal herself when she's sick, who can feed a family of six on one pound of hamburger, and who can persuade a nine-year-old to take a shower. Then the angel looked at the model of motherhood a little bit more and closely and said, but she's too soft. Oh, she's tough, said the Lord. You'd be surprised at how much this mother can do. Can she think, said the angel? Not only can she think, she can reason, compromise, and persuade. Then the angel reached over and touched her cheek. This one has a leak, he said. I told you you couldn't put that much into one model. That's not a leak, said the Lord. That's a tear. What's a tear for, said the angel? Well, it's for joy, for sadness, for sorrow, for disappointment, for pride. You're a genius, said the angel. And the Lord said, oh, but I didn't put it there. With all that in mind, I'd like to talk about one of the most interesting mothers in the Bible, the mother of two of Christ's most beloved disciples, James and John, Mother Zebedee. James and John were one of the first disciples Jesus chose. Along with Peter, they were Christ's most beloved disciples. They were fishermen who had partnered with Andrew and Peter in their fishing business. Since Peter and Andrew lived in Capernaum near the Sea of Galilee, it seems likely that the Zebedees lived nearby. I'm sure James and John reported back to the family the story of Jesus turning the wine, water into wine near Cana, where the Zebedee family in attendance at the synagogue in Capernaum the morning Jesus cast out the spirit in the middle of the service. Later that day, at the healing of Peter's mother-in-law in Peter and Andrew's home, when the whole town came out to watch Jesus healing the sick, I wonder if the Zebedees were there. As word spread about Jesus was doing as he traveled through Galilee, I'm sure the parents of James and John followed news of what their kids were involved in with great interest. And many women who came from Galilee with Jesus to care for him were watching from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of James and John, the sons of Zebedee. Whatever they were involved with during Jesus' early ministry, Mr. Zebedee's wife became totally committed to the one who taught her sons to fish for men. Ms. Zebedee was aware of the teachings of Jesus in his kingdom. She was also aware of the fact that her son James and John were very close to him. So she was certain that when the Lord formed his kingdom, they would have positions of responsibility and authority. But in Matthew chapter 23, Jesus tells a story that must have greatly disturbed her. It was a story about a landowner who went out to find laborers early in the morning. They agreed upon a fair day's wage and started working. Then at noon he went out again, found more, and they started working. And towards the evening he found more and they started working. Yet when the Lord paid them at the end of the day, they all received the same wage. It must have caused Mrs. Zebedee to wonder, will my sons really have positions of authority and responsibility in the Lord's new kingdom? Then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to Jesus with her sons, kneeling down, asking for a favor of him. What is it you want, he asked. She said, 
Grant that one of these two sons of mine sit at the right and the other at the left of the kingdom. You don't know what you're asking, Jesus said to them. Can you drink the cup I'm going to drink? You, we can, they answered. Jesus said, you will indeed drink from my cup, but to sit at the right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those whom they have prepared by my father. We might be very well, we might very well criticize Mrs. Zebedee for her presumptuous, but since this is Mother's Day, we ought to think about a few of the positive things Mother Zebedee did for her children. Number one, first of all, she came to the Lord praying for her sons might be part of the kingdom. I can think of no more important task for a mother than to seek to ensure that her children are part of the kingdom of God. It came across this inspirational story, when you thought I wasn't looking. When you thought I wasn't looking, I saw you hang my first painting on the refrigerator door, and I immediately wanted to paint another one. When you thought I wasn't looking, I saw you feed a stray cat, and I learned that it was good to be kind to animals. When you thought I wasn't looking, I saw you make my favorite cake for me, and I learned that the little things in life can be special. When you thought I wasn't looking, I watched you make a meal and take it to a friend who was sick, and I learned that all of us need to help take care of each other. When you thought I wasn't looking, I saw you give your time and money to help people who have nothing, and I learned that those who have something should give to those who don't. When you thought I wasn't looking, I saw you take care of our house and everything in it, and I learned we should be good stewards over everything that has been given to us. When you thought I wasn't looking, I saw how you handled your responsibilities even when you didn't feel well, and I learned to be responsible when I grew up. When you thought I wasn't looking, I saw tears come to your eyes, and I learned that sometimes things hurt and it's okay to cry. When you thought I wasn't looking, I noticed how much you cared for me and wanted everything that I could be. When you thought I wasn't looking, I learned that most of life's lessons that I need to know to be a kind and productive person when I grew up. When you thought I wasn't looking, I heard you pray, and I knew there was a God whom I could talk to and whom I could trust. When you thought I wasn't looking, I looked. Yes, I'm looking at you now, and I just want to say thanks for all the things I saw through you when you thought I wasn't looking. I know many mothers pray, and sometimes they pray out of necessity. Sometimes they pray because motherhood is not easy. It's extremely difficult. Sometimes you're filled with joy, sometimes with sadness. Sometimes your children make you proud, so proud you want to pop your buttons. And other times you can't find enough handkerchiefs to dry your, uh, you dry your tears. Being a parent is not easy. It's difficult. But Mrs. Zebedee gives us a valuable example, for she prayed earnestly that her sons would be part of the kingdom. We need to have the same concern for our kids. What good is, a, is our children if they're successful in making money, but they don't know God? What does it matter if they gain the whole world but lose their soul? I hope in the heart of every mother and father here this morning, there's a burden to go to the throne of God to pray for our children that they'll be with Christ. Number two, not only did Mrs. Zebedee pray for the children that would be part, that would be part of the kingdom, she prayed that they would be actively involved in the work of his kingdom. Obviously, Mrs. Zebedee was a forceful mom and likely a forceful wife, and so was my mom. Moms need to be forceful, especially when it concerns their children and Jesus. Jesus nicknamed her sons the Sons of Thunder, and likely they got their personality trait from their mom. She was influential, and she raised two influential children who helped change the world. What I see in Mrs. Zebedee is a mother's heart. Some of you may have heard of St. Augustine. Augustine of Hippo is widely regarded as one of the most influential Christians of all time. From the age of 32 to 75, 
He wrote five million words with one of his, his most popular collections called the Confessions of St. Augustine. He's undoubtedly one of the most brilliant, gifted, godly men in all history. But it wasn't always that way. He was naturally brilliant, but he was a terrible person growing up. Augustine was born in 325 A.D. to a man named Petraeus and to a woman named Monica in, in North Africa in what we would call today Algeria. 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 Monica was raised in a Christian home, but apparently her parents didn't think much of her faith because her parents arranged her to marry Petraeus, who was a pagan. Not only was a, he was a pagan, he was a scumbag. He didn't physically abuse her, but he was known for flying into fits of rage. He also cheated on her at every opportunity. For a few years after they were married, she gave birth to Augustine. Like many women who find themselves in that situation, she invested all her hopes and her dreams in her baby boy. But as he grew into adolescence, he broke her heart. He broke her heart by stealing, by lying. But he mainly broke her heart by his living immoral life, his immoral lifestyle. She wanted nothing more for her son than to be a Christian. But instead, he was growing up like his father. She could have pitched a fit. She could have become violent with her husband and son. She could have yelled, cursed, nagged them, but she didn't. She loved her husband, even though he didn't deserve it. She loved her son, even though he had rejected her and broke her heart. Augustine later recognized that God was speaking to him through the prayers of his mother, mother Monica. But even as God spoke to him through her, he continued to turn away and break her heart. Nothing breaks a mother's heart like a rebellious child. But Monica didn't enter the battle for her son alone. Paganism was practiced throughout the Roman Empire, and women didn't have a voice at home, and they certainly didn't have a voice in society. The whole deck was stacked against her. Every, everybody around her told her that her son was just doing only things natural. Boys will be boys, but only sowing his wild oats. Everybody's doing it. But she didn't care if everybody was doing it or not. She knew her son Augustine was lost, and she wasn't going to let him go to hell without a fight. But wep what weapons did she have to deal with? She fought with the most effective weapon she had, which is also the most effective weapon we have, she prayed for her son. Here's what Augustine wrote about his mother's prayers. And now thou didst stretch forth thy hand from above, and didst draw up my soul out of that profane, profound darkness because of my mother, thy faithful one, and weep on thee on my behalf more than mothers have accustomed to weep for the bodily deaths of their children. For the light of the faith and spirit, which she received from thee, she saw was dead. O Lord, thou didst hear her, and despise not her tears. When pouring down, they watched, watered the earth, and under her eyes, in every place where she prayed, thou didst truly hear her. It didn't happen overnight. As a matter of fact, it took 32 years for the Lord to answer her prayers. 32 years of heartbreak. 32 years of worry and doubt, 32 years of faithfulness and long-suffering. But through it all, Monica prayed, and she faithfully prayed, and she patiently waited. And after 32 years, her prayers were answered. Moms, how long have you been praying for your children? How long have you been waiting for the Lord to answer? Don't give up. The Lord heard her prayers and answered her prayers, and he'll do the same for ours. All those years, Monica prayed for Augustine, and the Lord answered her prayers. Because of her patience, peaceful, loving testimony, he gave her so much more. Just a few years before he died, the Lord used Monica's faithful and obedient, quiet witness to change the heart of her husband. Jesus changed him from an abusive, hateful man to a child of God. And on top of that, her legacy, her, her legacy lives on as her example continues to teach younger women, she is now called St. Monica, the patron saint of mothers. You see, a mother's work is never truly done. It continues through a mother's heartache, to a mother's prayers, 
to a mother's joy, and it ends with a mother's memory. Where are we this morning? Are we teaching our children with our godly example? Do we have children we need to pray for? Do we have a spouse do we need to pray for? Maybe we're the ones that need Christ in our life. Because without Christ in our life, we have no way to deal with the heartaches when they come. And last and third, Mrs. Zebedee had big expectations. It says Mrs. Zebedee came with her children kneeling down. What impact do you think it had on that example of her children? Mom, your children will never forget you observing you kneel in prayer, lifting your hands in praise and worship. It will impact your children and the, for the remainder of their lives. When we're working in the kingdom, there are no higher positions to the left and right of the king himself, and that's what she wanted for her sons. She didn't just pray for our children to be doorkeepers. She wanted them to be on the right and left of Jesus. You may consider this presumptuous and brash, but I admire her boldness. Too often people settle for mediocrity in life and their service to Christ. Jesus didn't grant her request, but neither did deny it. He simply said, you don't understand. After the resurrection, James became a thundering force. The church multiplied as thousands and thousands came to Christ. Thundering James became the primary target, and Herod had him arrested and executed. James was the first disciple, first apostle to, be, be, to, to die. Did Mrs. Zebedee really understand what she was asking? John still thunders today as he wrote five books of the Bible, with the last being the book of Revelations, he wrote on the Isle of uh, Petros um, and was the last apostle to die. Moms, how are you influencing your children? How are you teaching them to be great? My mother said to me, if you become a soldier, you'll be a general. If you become a monk, you'll end up as the pope. Instead, I became a painter and I wound up as Picasso. George Washington said, I am, I am what I am because of my mother. Dr. Benjamin Carson, the renowned neurosurgeon and recent presidential candidate, would agree. Listen to what he says about his mom. Ms. Carson insisted that Ben and his brother, Curtis, write a book report every few weeks. This wasn't for school. It was just for his mom. Ben and Curtis dutifully obeyed. About the time he was in junior high, high school, Ben finally realized something very shocking. His mom couldn't read. For years, Ben had been, been working on all those book reports and, and assuming that his mom was checking every word, but she didn't have a clue what he was saying. Now consider this. Raised by an illiterate mom, Ben grew up to be a world-famous neurologist. His illiterate mom didn't twist her hands over her lack of learning and give up hope of raising intelligent boys. And she, instead, she gave her boys what she had, interest, accountability, and the courage to demand extra work. And it paid off. For too long, some of us have been content with just barely making it through the door. For too long, we've been content to sit back and let things happen. It's time for us to take our positions at the right and left hand to become leaders in molding, molding and fashioning the outreach of our church and mobilizing to make sure the message of Christ goes into all the world. It's time to strive for excellence, to reach to, for the very best there is. The Lord calls us to be his disciples and to be effective laborers in the kingdom. I suppose that's why today is so special, because we recognize that a mother's love is the closest example we have to God's love. It's a love that goes through the valley of the shadow of death, to bring life into being. It's a love that sacrifices itself over and over again and would even dare to lay down its life for its offspring. Ms. Zebedee asked Christ to place her sons on the left and right. Jesus turned this into a teaching moment. We all want our children to be great. Instead, we should want our children to be great servants. Moms, how are we raising our children to be servants? A measure of person is not how many servants they have, but rather how many people they serve. A great person is a great servant. So I ask you this, 
Why are moms so influential? Why are moms so great? It's because a great mom is a great servant. And I thank God that my mom was.
community of Christ, your names given as a divine blessing is your identity and calling. If you will discern and embrace its full meaning, you will not only discover your future, you will become a blessing to the whole creation. Do not be afraid to go where it beckons you to go. Jesus Christ, the embodiment of God's shalom, invites all people to come and receive divine peace in the midst of difficult questions and struggles of life. Follow Christ in the way that leads to God's peace and discover the blessings of all the dimensions of salvation. Generously share the invitation, ministry, and sacrament through which people can encounter the living God who heals and reconciles through the redemptive relationships in sacred communities. The restoring of persons to healthy and righteous relationship with God, others, themselves, and the earth is at the heart of the purpose of your journey as a people of faith. May the love of God, the peace of Jesus, and the comfort of Holy Spirit go with you as you depart. Amen.